Coming up on American Black Journal, our series on the black church in Detroit continues, this time with a look at prison ministries. We'll hear about the services that are offered to men and women who are incarcerated and to their families. Plus, we'll visit a Detroit church that is helping exonerated prisoners re-enter society. It's all next on American Black Journal. Stay where you are. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. We are continuing our series on the Black Church in Detroit, which is produced in partnership with the Ecumenical Theological Seminary and the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Today, we're looking at prison and jail ministries in the Black Church. These programs provide spiritual guidance, referral services, and mentoring to the incarcerated to their families and to ex-offenders. Here's my conversation with Bishop Mbayu Chui from the Shrine of the Black Madonna and Reverend Samuel Spruill, CEO of the nonprofit organization, Hope. So I actually wanna start with uh, a little context to talk about how important uh, this issue that we're talking about today is, especially here in Detroit. And I'll just start with a number uh, I've seen statistics that say that one in every three African-American males uh, in our city uh, has been incarcerated at some point. So if you think about that, that means that a third of the male population, the predominant male population of the city has had an experience uh, with the criminal justice system, but it means that their families, their neighbors, and their communities have also had some of that experience and, and, and are affected with it. So I always say that this is, not, um, this is not an issue in a community in Detroit. This is an issue for Detroiters, for all of us. We all uh, have some incidents with um, the prevalence of incarceration uh, of, of African-Americans uh, in this country and, and in this city. So with that being the case, the work that uh, you two are doing, which is to provide spiritual guidance and support and mentoring to not only those who are incarcerated, but, uh, but to their families uh, as well is just so critically important. So first of all, thank you to both of you for what you're doing. Um, but let's start with how important the work of the ministry is for those who are in jail uh, and in prison. I'm not sure that everybody necessarily understands that uh, the kind of support that you're giving uh, is so, so crucial. Bishop Chewy, I'll, I'll start with you. So as you said, Stephen, the uh, impact is, is much broader than people think. Uh, if Michigan has 14% African-American, but we make up 53% of prison population, that's, that's phenomenal. That's a lot of people who are being affected. And then you add in their children, their family and all that. So it's a, it's a lot of uh, impact and consequences as a result of that. So the work is really important. It's, it's not just the work that, that goes on inside of uh, correctional facilities, but what we do in the community to uh, bridge the gap uh, that families and especially children are impacted by the absence of a parent. Uh, you have over, I don't know, 
50,000 children who have an incarcerated father and maybe another uh, 3,000 children who have an incarcerated mother. And again, of those statistics for the state of Michigan, more than 55% of them are African-American. So it, it's a tremendous amount of work that, that must be done. Can you talk, Bishop Chewy, just a little about what it looks like inside uh, prisons and, and jails, what a ministry is uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with uh, bars and guards and all kinds of restrictions? That's a good question. So when I first started the ministry in Detroit, I began prison, prison ministry in, in Houston, Texas, at our church in Houston. And when I came to Detroit in 2000, then I started doing prison ministry here in, in the city again. And uh, I started at Ryan and Mound Correctional Facilities. And when I first went in, the first thing I asked myself, I wanted to see what all the other ministries were doing because I didn't want to duplicate what was already being done. And uh, so what I saw was Bible study worship, Bible study worship. I said, okay, they got that covered. So I, I want to bring culture, I want to bring history, I want to bring spiritual awareness, I want to bring values. Uh, so I started to put together programs, design programs and events, classes around those themes and trying to especially empower uh, the inmates to understand that even though you're here behind these bars and walls, you still have an obligation and responsibility to your community. So how do we bridge those gaps? what work needs to be done. So we started thinking about projects that could happen in the community, even though they were incarcerated. So we put together several kinds of programs to address the needs, especially of the children of incarcerated parents. Uh, Reverend Spruill, uh, talk about HOPE, uh, how you founded it and what the work is mm -hmm. that, uh, that you're doing. Well, let me give a little background. Uh, thanks for having me, number one. Uh, uh, Hope came as part of the Mission of Baptist Church ministry. We do the we the army to the community that does the outreach into the minute to, to the community. One of them happens to be the prison ministry. Uh, I have 31 years of experience in jail and prison ministry. I, I started down at Wayne County. I went from Wayne County to uh, Mound Prison, then from Mound out to Macomb, and um, had a chance to go to Angolia to um, be a part of that prison ministry there, and also at Fox Hills in the Bahamas. So I've been around prison ministry uh, a long time. And so for the impact is on our community, it's, it's very, it's very uh, devastating to our community. When a person's gone, uh, as from the house, from the home, it makes it hard on the families. And so what we do is um, on the tap and on, I started the leadership of uh, Dr. F.G. Sampson 31 years ago, and now I'm working with uh, Pastor Mason Johnson. And uh, so it's been great work working with the church. So our role is going into the prison, um, have our Bible studies, we have a worship service. But while I'm there, and this is where I us give them, give them hope, I want to share with them what about hope. Uh, when you get out, these are the programs that are available to you. We have a bakery that you can learn baking skills. We teach you how to bake. And also they give them a, a source of income, OK? And so we, along with that is we teach them about financial training as well. It's come in March, they learn how to, uh, about budgeting, because it's one thing to get a job. It's another thing to teach men how to manage his money. And so we all encourage people to get their jobs, but I said, get a job, but also we encourage you guys to build a career. And so with the hope, what we try to do, we try to meet the physical, social, and uh, emotional needs of the individual. We do a partnership with other entities. For instance, uh, prime example be the Center for the Works of Mercy, uh, there you can receive your dental care, uh, you got counseling there, um, you got food closet there, we have the, um, all the social needs a person may need. So I'm giving them hope, you come home, contact me, call me, I want to help you. Also, we'll sign them a mentor, we do an intake on the individual, we do a, uh, sit down and do an intake on them, find out just what their needs are, and then we, we uh, map out a short-term goal and a long-term goal for them to try to achieve it. So that's what we do at Hope. So uh, that that coming home, uh, the idea of somebody uh, who has been incarcerated coming back to the community and trying to start their lives over, start uh, find a, a life that really was was taken from them. Um, 
that that's a, a it's it's a policy uh, discussion that we have a lot, right? Uh, about mm -hmm. making sure things are available, making sure there are opportunities. It seems to me, Reverend Sproul, that you are dealing with this not only at that level, but at a very personal level in, yes. in terms of how that person reintegrates with their family, uh, yes. how that person uh, becomes a member of the community again. Can you talk about how that work? Um, yes, what we do is and when you come to Hope uh, for intake and as you first get out, you first get called me right away, you, you get released Friday, we'll come to the, we'll meet at Hope Friday along with your family. You know, we have family. Some, some guys, uh, families is uh, no longer have passed while they've incarcerated, so it's hard on them. But we try to bring the family together along with the mentor. Okay, this is how we're going to work through these issues. So this person, you know, they've been going for a while, so let them know, hey, things are not the same. You've been going 15 years, and in their minds, they still think, they still go back to 15 years ago, but things have changed. And so counseling with him, them along with the family, walking them through this process, it's going to be a process, and be patient with them and uh, sharing the resource that we have to bridge that gap between the, the 15 years. It's hard. And this with a mentor come in to walk alongside the family and the, and the returning citizens as well. Yeah. Uh, Bishop Chewy, I, I wonder if you can talk some about the family side of this uh, or some more about the family side of this, the loss that uh, families feel when somebody goes away uh, to jail or to prison, but then the, the, I guess that emotional, um, uh, the emotional side of returning somebody and uh, having somebody come, come back home, uh, that part of the ministry has to look really different, I guess, from what, uh, what you're doing inside the prison with the people who are incarcerated. Yeah, so both sides of the equation are very important uh, when you talk about impacts on families. Uh, I got a call to come to an elementary school uh, to a third grade classroom because a third grader was getting picked on by the, her peers in the classroom because her father was incarcerated. So I went to the classroom, talked to the kids. I told them a story about a person who was incarcerated and that person's feelings about not being able to see their children. And then I asked the students, so how would you feel if you were in prison and you had a child that you couldn't see, you couldn't talk to, you couldn't hug, you couldn't guide and lead and be a part of their life, how would that make you feel? But I took it even further than that. I asked them to write down what you would say. Uh, so they all wrote letters to inmates uh, and expressing their feelings about how they must feel not being able to be a part of their child's life. So I took those same letters to, I, I was teaching a creative writing class at Ryan and Mile. So I took those letters to the guys in my creative writing class and I asked them to write letters back to the children. And they did. And it, we had this exchange going on for weeks uh, between the kids and the inmates just to, to deal with those feelings and those issues and to address some of the emotional wounds. So both sides got to see this impact and how it affected the psyches of the kids and of the parents. Uh, but that's the kind of uh, ministry, healing, that needs to be addressed on both sides. And to, to address it, I had the inmates come up with ideas. So we had something called the Child of the Month Club that we did at Ryan and Mound. And every month we pick a charity to give uh, resources to that support incarcerated parents, children of incarcerated parents. And all those kind of projects and community connections are important to embrace uh, families who are dealing with incarceration and loss. But when somebody comes home, uh, that has to be a whole process too. And we try to, in the Tree of Love ministry, we try to work on that before they get home and try to create a, a smoother pathway for them to come home into uh, because we're connected to so many resources in the community because we've been doing this for almost 20 years now. And uh, so we are able to plug people in into resources and to employers that work with uh, people who have felons on their record and, and just try to connect them to the spiritual and emotional resources as well to get counseling and guidance because it, it's not easy just coming out. You've been gone for 15, 20 years. Not only do you not know how the world is operating, but you don't, you don't have any, any uh, support system 
uh, and until you get reconnected even to the people that you care about the most. So it, it's a tremendous amount of work and it's, it's never ending. People ask me, when do I do prison ministry? It's 24 seven, 365. Yeah. So I, I wanna give both of you a chance to talk about things we might do differently um, to make uh, to make this a more manageable issue in our community. I mean, obviously, um, there are all kinds of criminal justice reforms that, that we need to enact. Uh, it would help if we could uh, remove the systemic racism from the criminal justice system that sends African-Americans away at uh, much higher rates than, than other Americans. But, but as the people on the front lines uh, ministering to those affected, I wonder if you have things that, that, that you would like to see uh, be different. Uh, Bishop Chui, I'll start with you. Well, I would like, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, when Ryan and Mound closed, that was devastating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was devastating. Because people be are closed. further away now. Yes, not only to be disconnected from your family, but now you're miles and miles away. They have no way to come see you. They have no way to, to connect with you. Uh, and especially now during the pandemic, visitation is very limited. And a lot of visitation is done the way we're doing this, this meeting right now. Uh, yeah. So it, it, really, it really weighs on the psyche, uh, those kind of issues that could, could be alleviated by uh, uh, correct political correctness. Uh, there are over 31 facilities in Michigan. Yeah. Right and Mount should have been the last two prisons to be closed. Mm -hmm. uh, but those kind of issues I would like to see addressed uh, from the state level. There's so much more we can do to support the families of the incarcerated at the state level. Uh, so it's policy changes, but I think it's also uh, providing resources uh, because the amount of money families spend uh, when they have an incarcerated loved one, the phone calls, the, the JPay emails, the the care packages that is all it's a tremendous amount of money that people have to pay to support their loved one uh, and something can be done about that yeah uh reverend sprule yeah what i would like to see uh for instance what we're doing now with uh southwest uh community courts uh people have um infraction with the law for instance may need to uh suspend a driver license make that called trafficking uh those are misdemeanors and so uh, send them to hope again, we have the, um, the opportunity to do the community service. And there we encourage them, okay, do your community service, do what is directed by the courts? Because that misdemeanor can turn to a felon escalates and then we get an edge to incarceration. And so I think the system, we look at what can we do instead of just locking people up? Uh, can we get, let them do community service, hook up with the churches and communities? and allow them community service and match with a mentor and walk us alongside them, help them correct the action then, rather than just say, well, we're just gonna send this person away for one or two years. Uh, that'd be one way to deter the incarceration if we catch them now. And also working with uh, SOAR, a uh, nonprofit that offers uh, reading to tutoring to students in school. I've been working with them, the church and the community to help get that reading level. Cause you know, we build prison according to fourth grade reading level. So that's important. It's like prevention, what can we do to prevent to get to that point of incarceration? And so let's rev up the, the, the uh, schools, get them more involved, get more volunteers in, they had that reading level. So when they graduate, they go to school and get some type of uh, skill and learn, rather than just dropping out, because the drop out, they end up more like being incarcerated. And then we gotta get another. So I'm looking at on the back end, what can we do on the back end to prevent uh, individuals being incarcerated? And I'd like to see more programs proactive rather than being reactive. We spend a lot of money on after they come home. Well, let's spend some money on, um, on prevention before they get there. Another aspect of prison ministry involves the men and women who are set free from prison after being wrongly imprisoned in the first place. United Kingdom Church in Detroit hosts regular welcome home celebrations for exonerated inmates, and it helps them readjust to life outside of prison. Producer AJ Walker has the story. This room of worship is transformed into a place of hope at the welcome home ceremony for people who have been exonerated after being convicted of crimes they didn't commit. To Mr. Daryl Six, 34 years crime he didn't commit. Daryl Six, come on up here. 
After serving years, and in some cases decades, their freedom is solidified and commemorated at the United Kingdom Church in Detroit. Being released from prison after so much time, exonerees could be met with a world that has left them behind. Instead, we make sure these guys have linen, vital records, and everything else in between. We got stuff in here that's got tags on them. Look, brand new suits, tags on them. We actually had a whole room downstairs literally an entire room full of clothing and we got rid of those uh we donated all those rental assistance jobs health care suicide or prevention mental health assistance you name it helping them to find their children pastor terrence devison is one of the co-founders of the ambassadors group which holds the welcome home ceremonies for those the judicial system had written off. We were the first contact with some of those who've been gone for decades. Why? Because they just wanted somebody, Ms. Walker, to say, I'm sorry, publicly, and that I care. Co-founder Maxine Willis says the ceremonies not only welcome home those who had never thought they would see freedom again. It's not only just having welcome home ceremonies and meeting the needs of the exonerees, but it's working hard to erase the stigma. It's about commemorating justice finally served. Was it easy? Is it easy getting companies and organizations to donate and help you do this? In the beginning, it was very difficult because for many, this is their first time even dealing, even contemplating wrongfully convicted. We were running into brick walls. So we thought, okay, what are we going to do? <laughs> Sit back and do nothing? So we thought, well, we're going to have to just roll up our sleeves. And with the support of United Kingdom Church, um, going in our pockets to do what we had to do. The Ambassadors Group has come a long way since they began their work in 2018. Now, many people and organizations donate their time and money to make this church a beacon of hope and provide the resources it takes to give exonerees a new beginning. And that's the most important of all, as we look around and see our exonerees and our special guests here today. Willis says these ceremonies also create a bond between the wrongfully convicted, as some in attendance have been in those exact same shoes before. When they see other men <laughs> who can identify with them who went through some of the same challenges that they went through, being locked up and incarcerated, seeing these men come and hug them and welcome them home has just been the most uh, rewarding aspect that we've been able to be a part of. Once the welcome home celebrations are over, the resources provided at this church become invaluable because exonerees are facing a world that has dramatically changed. It's totally different. It's, everything has changed. You know, for people like me, coming out of prison, wrongfully convicted, uh, with nothing. Jawan Deering was recently released after serving 15 years for a crime. He said from the moment he was accused, he didn't commit. He was convicted of arson and deliberately starting a fire that killed five children. He was sentenced to life in prison, but he says he was released after a videotaped recording of a key witness proved his innocence. And they found that the person of the home said that I wasn't the one that, that was out there. The same detective who put me in prison was the same detective that interviewed him and had the information all this time. Freedom didn't come easy. Um, staying in that law library every day, uh, writing letters every day to people uh, who were in authority that to, that can help me because I was stuck. His efforts finally paid off and someone finally took a harder look at his case. And they contacted my lawyer and that's when the uh, ball had turned because they actually discovered the uh, wrongs that were uh, committed by the prosecution at that time. Deering says he didn't expect a welcome home ceremony, but he was grateful when he got one. I was very, very, very happy and very appreciative of, of, of Reverend Terrence uh, for, and his church for 
giving me that welcome. I mean, Tommy Hearns was there. It was a, a great time, beautiful time. And I did get a TV, um, clothes, everything, you know, money. I mean, it was beautiful. So I was just enjoying the moment. And I had to enjoy the moment just in case it was a dream, you know. <laughs> Now that he's home, he spends his time getting used to his new life. Welcome to my office. And this is the TV um, that I uh, received from a young lady at the church. I had to put pictures, frames, different things that I need, but I'm gonna get it going, you know. It takes one day at a time, you know. Every day is a dream because I'm free. I'm home. That is going to do it for us this week. You can find out more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.